Hello and welcome to another episode of Rikindi, where we are simply trying to uncover the truth about this experience we call life. Today, I am joined by Alyssa, who has just completed her PhD in artificial intelligence. Hello, Alyssa, and welcome. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Awesome. So, Alyssa, do you want to just tell everyone uh, who's listening a little bit about yourself um, and what got you interested in artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, Well, I'm a social scientist. I'm someone who, for a long period of time, um, have been very interested in the connection of people to place and society. Um, What got me interested in artificial intelligence was um, back in 2017, so not that long ago really, I... um, was having a bit of an average time at work. So I do a lot of consultancy work. I have my own business. I love doing facilitation of change processes with with people in organisations. And I'd come across this fellow who um, was really not happy with the change process and he ended up sort of being not a very pleasant person to work with. And and it got me thinking this was an organisational change um, that wasn't super complex, And it got me thinking about future models of work uh, and the increase in use of technology and how artificial intelligence, which at that time um, there was a lot of talk about AI taking our jobs and, you know, the the future of work is, is going to be sort of very different than what it is today. And I thought since I'm interested in organisational change, I'd love to sort of start to explore with people what the implications of uh, artificial intelligence is on organisations and in particular, what are some of the implications that we need to consider as part of the change process? Because I really honestly thought that artificial intelligence has got such incredible sort of opportunity to bring good value, but it's also something that can actually lead to negative implications as well. So I just wanted to unpack all of that. Um, and that's that's what got me interested in AI. I'm not a technologist. I'm someone who, who definitely as part of my work has come from a human-centered uh, and planet-centered perspective. So AI was more like the, the sort of muse, I guess, that I could, could use as almost like a subject to um, investigate. And then um, I had a, a number of really fantastic uh, people who, who volunteered to be part of the qualitative research process um, to do with my doctoral research that I've just um, recently submitted for assessment. Exciting. Oh, that's so mm. exciting. No, that's, yeah. that's so cool. Um, the, the angle that you're going in because, um, you know, obviously for those who are listening, the whole um, concept of Rikindi is really um, is, is that, is trying to find that um, staying connected to your breath, to your body, um, to what we have in this physical space when there's so much evolving and changing within the AI space. Um, you know, the world around us is changing so rapidly. And like you're saying, I'm so interested to hear the implications that it'll have have because um you know everything has its pros and cons and it's just that awareness um and keeping making sure that you know we are making ethical decisions um and because it can be phenomenal Mm -hmm. if we utilize it correctly yes yes definitely and you know this is partly with with any form of technology in the wrong hands or with the wrong um um, sort of a negative um, a focus underneath it. It can it can affect everything, including the way that you know the AI is actually designed and programmed in the first place um, to to its use. Um, and you know there there are plenty of examples out there that um, can can talk about what the the future could be like if AI is theoretically used for um, for negative uh, related purposes as opposed to uh, the stories that are starting to come out more about utilizing it more for positive purposes so yeah so so that's that's what got me interested in AI um, just to sort of find a, a balance and also to think specifically about if we're going to um, adapt organizations so I, I after seeing um, organizations handle 
so let's say simple changes poorly I thought well this is actually challenging the whole concept of humans in the workplace and so mm-hmm. it, it means that there's there's difference so that's that's what got me um keen to sort of explore it and that's what the last four years has been for me um to be sort of exploring um in that space yeah wow wow if you do for those listening um who may not be too familiar with ai yeah it's incredible like i i think you know some of those early early developments um <laughs> understanding that you know the concept of AI has been around for um, many, many years. And even I, I, one of the first papers that I wrote as part of my doctorate was a, what they call a genealogy or, you know, like a long-term sort of um, historical view of um, the concept of artificial intelligence. And, and even uh, back, you know, um, thousands of years ago, there were concepts of robotic robotic humans um, or robotic machines, uh, moving parts, um, the autonom- autonotons, it's a bit of a hard word to say. Um, yeah, but but processes that you think that whole mechanisation of the human and the thought of doing that has been around for a really long period of time. And some of the early processes, even though they weren't sort of super fast, but they were still incredibly sophisticated um, processes um, and then, unfortunately, what I what I also found, but fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of technology developments have happened due to funding from um, military pursuits. So, um, artificial intelligence got a very good um, injection of interest due to um, some of the world wars that occurred earlier in the nineteenth um, in the nineteen hundreds, and and that's when um, people were really starting to think that this this concept of automating um, intelligence um, could actually be possible. In, and technology of this nature has also mirrored the developments in uh, in power and electric- electricity sources. And, and so, um, yeah, the fact that eventually with the concept of um, that – uh, artificial intelligence would would overcome human human endeavors and and with with alpha alpha zero um, and and alpha go related processes it's just incredible um, to see that in action and and then of course um, seeing the reactions of the chess community because because it is like um, an incredible game to sort of master um, and it does take humans lots of practice to do so yeah I too was very um, very sort of um, stunned to see that process and and realizing just the power um, of AI in terms of processing speed and that's one of the areas that it's been used in the most is just that ability to say well um, in the old days they used to call them calculators and they're not calculators <laughs> like the plastic ones that we have in our in our school bags but a calculator was the name of a person who would be really good at adding adding stuff up <laughs> and yeah. and so the calculator concept um has just been amplified um with the power of of clever programmers with clever algorithms but within a very um finite focus area so chess you know despite its you know range of different choices that you can make and and the need to sort of you know anticipate almost what your your competitor is actually doing um to be able to design ai to focus on um a game which has got specific moves you know the pieces even are sort of black and white there's there's uh, exact number of squares they never change the roles are the same um yeah it means that it's easier for them to design um ai which i know still would have taken a lot of complexity and time but easier because it's boxed like it's in a it's in a in a really clear box but if ai is applied in in areas where there's a lot of let's call it gray areas um it means that it, it it still may need a form of human um, intervention to sort of almost like assure decisions that come from it. Um, so, so at the moment, in my in my reading, AI is used used most prolifically more in that sort of ability to to sort of speed up the the power of analysis within areas that can be analysed because they are related to numbers, or we can get things down to a quantified sort of element. Mm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd see that. Um, I mean, I've read a few articles um, that have stated the first job um, you're looking at uh, being taken would be 
um, ones where you'd have to uh, download as such a large amount of information and then almost regurgitate it or see where it could fit. And you can look at our lawyers and doctors fall quite nicely in that field because if you're studying to be a doctor, you have to study all of these different um, cases or, or uh, reactions that the body may face and then how can you um, treat those and so a lot of the time, you know, you'd have to get a blood sample, which would then come back. And so you can see how that process, you've got a computer which can download, you know, every single medical history from the beginning of time. Um, mm. And then, you know, you could uh, get your blood taken right there on the spot and it could, you know, um, provide the, the data um, of what that is and then it'd give you exactly what, what you have. Um, yeah. And then same with where you would have all of these law cases that it could just uh, download and then it could say, okay, well, look at this space on this case um, and they won. Therefore, you know, this is, is a great form of evidence to provide. Mm, yeah, that's that's a really great um, set of different examples. And I think it is when, when they talk about some of the jobs that, you know, AI, it might be AI in a robotic body um, as well. So a bit of a combination of a number of different um, um, knowledge domains um, because the field is very broad. Like I use the term artificial intelligence and a lot of people say, oh, you know, what sort of artificial intelligence do you mean? Like, you know, do you mean, um, you know, um, AI that's more sort of to do with um, reactive or, or is it more of a, a self-aware type of AI or is it machine learning or is it, and even within machine learning, is it supervised? Is it unsupervised? Is it, you know, what what is the actual um, uh, field itself? And so I... I found um, that was was one of the first things I needed to sort of crystallise in my mind for my my recent studies has been thinking everyone has got a slightly different term of what artificial intelligence means. And for those in the community of like being the tech tech programmers, which I certainly am not one of them, <laughs> but I, I sort of honour honor the role that they have certainly, um, that that I honestly think that the field is is blossoming and booming. And and if you say someone see someone who says, Oh, I'm an AI programmer, you might say, Well, what what's what sort? Because AI is looking at, you know, sense making, it's looking at vision, it's looking at um, mobility, if we're gonna um, put it as part of a um, you know, like a teleoperated type of robotic process, or is it autonomous? Um, uh, so the field is very broad, um, and and that that to me means that the possibilities are really broad. But it requires those different domain specialists often to work together if uh, we're ever going to sort of um, move to a concept of um, you know like uh, movies of like iRobot, where you know the robots have their own sort of um, place and role, and if every home has got one who makes you a coffee in the morning. <laughs> Well, which has its own ethical problems as well from a concept of, of, of servitude as well. Um, and, and that's always quite quite fascinating. When when does a machine um, actually become something that actually has rights? Mm. Well, wasn't it, um, and I could be wrong, wasn't there a country recently that had um, given rights to a, a robot? Uh, yes, I think, I think so. I think it was recently. I certainly, um, have heard, heard of, um, some contexts where, uh, people can actually, um, you know, have the, have the right to, um, you know, marry, marry their robot, <laughs> which is a bit oh, of a well, weird sort of process. And, and yeah, but there certainly is, um, certainly is, but I can't off the top of my head right now work out what what country it was. I had a look and it's um so Sophia the robot, an intelligent Sophia, humanoid yes. Yeah, intelligent humanoid robot of Hansen Robotics was granted citizenship by Saudi Arabia in two thousand seventeen, making it the first yeah. country in the world to grant a robot a status reserved for humans, which is actually a little bit frightening because um firstly Sophia, I've actually seen Sophia, it's not very human like at all. And so when you're already kind of looking at that space and granting that citizenship, I think you're stepping into quite dangerous grounds, um, spe specifically because we don't really know, um, you know, fully what AI will become. Like, as you were saying just now with all of those different avenues that it could, uh, is already growing in, um, you've also got, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think my understanding and one of the things that is quite frightening, but also quite exciting, 
with AI is when you have um, a bunch of children in a classroom and you're teaching them um, about a topic, let's say, for instance, one or two of the kids will get, get it. Let's say one kid will get it 100% and the rest of the class is still trying to work it out. The teacher's got to sit and eventually explain it to everyone or some of them will just never get it. With AI, yeah. once one AI gets it and because it's all connected online, every AI gets it straight away. That's every kid, every person on the planet will instantly understand what that means. And so that you can build on um, like crazy. I mean, that'll just compound and compound and compound that we can't even comprehend. Yeah, yeah that's Am the I scale. And, you know, we just see the way that the world is connected now. And and um, and I know a number of different clients that I work with um, uh, dealing, with, um, dealing with concepts to do with cyber um, cyber security um, issues that are that are only getting getting more and more complex, um, and and so if you add um, the the potential power for that at scale um, instantaneous shift and change, um, it's it's the world where you know some of those science fiction movies um, you know could become a reality. Like you know what is it the 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 Roomba. Um, vacuum cleaner that a lot of people have or or the toy uh, robot dog that lots of kids are going to be getting for Christmas in various parts of the world. Um, they, they all at the moment have a link um, to get more features, get more functionality um, if you have to plug them in to mm. to the broader grid. So there, there are a variety of different risks and implications of that. But then there's also, as, as we talk about, sort of incredible opportunities. And, and it does, at, at this stage, rely heavily on the human, human owner, hum, human coder of those products to be able to um, essentially code in safety mechanisms. Um, but there isn't a global uh, regulatory system at the moment in this space. Um, there's a number of different attempts to try to um, identify what would be, uh, let's call them codes of practice or, or principles for artificial intelligence, et cetera. But still they're, they're like not necessarily regulated right, right now. Um, they're, they're probably starting to be in some countries that are well in advance of, of Australia for example, um, in this space, um, but certainly um, there, there are some um, considerations that I think means that um, the people who invest in AI in their businesses, the people who create it and code it, and the people who own those software development companies um, or labs um, all need to have a degree of accountability um, in terms of making sure that what they create is actually um, not not uh, not likely to go rogue <laughs> in a loving way. <laughs> yeah, I think Elon Musk actually on, or he might have left recently because it was um, in conflict with uh, his Tesla, but I think he was part of um, an AI ethics board that he was one of the main founders for and you know, yeah. co-founders, um, which there's a bunch of guys literally sitting all day discussing how they can... Um, create AI or like just, you know, try and, and, but like you're saying, it's not, um, regular regulated. It's funny, as you were saying that about the, um, robots and the, uh, the vacuum cleaners, I don't know if you heard in the background, but that was actually our, um, our robot vacuum cleaner. It's French. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was just coming to the floor. So I quickly had to, had to turn it off, but, um, you can see even with Google Nest um, and so on, you have this entire environment where, your entire home is automated by this artificial intelligence. And I think there's an element to that that's kind of creepy because um, it is actually, this is, and like you were saying before, where a lot of it's funded by military, you've also got to look at the, and I'm sure you've looked deeply into this as well, is the companies that are funding it. So like Amazon, for instance, if they're funding a lot of artificial intelligence, it's not to help humanity. It's more to enhance um, purchasing from the consumer and so how do you do that well you study consumers behavior and so then how yes. do you do that well you have things like google nest or amazon prime which is alexa <laughs> their, their amazon automated system um which is essentially probably watching pe people looking at how much they're purchasing looking at what they're purchasing what time they're purchasing it at so they can predict their behavior to then manipulate them to purchase and so that's yes. in one of those probably a bit iffy i'd say yeah, yeah, it is some it's something that that does. Um, you can understand why some people decide to go off grid <laughs> if they can. But then the way that our society works um, is is very much trying to get people on on grid. So um, 
yeah, it, it does. It does um, mean that for me that there's there's the opportunities for 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 good people who and I think the the Elon Musk group um, or the the role that he was playing at the time was in a group that was talking about AI being good for humanity. I think it was something like that from memory, and and so that I think did have some some principles behind it that. Um, definitely um, are focusing on making sure that there are the necessary checks and balances um, in place, um, which doesn't necessarily mean stifling the creativity um, of which which it is a form of creativity is the the science behind the coding and and the creation of the 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 sort of machine, but it does um, mean that people who approach it have that um you know ethical lens and and that's a core part of any testing regime prior to as they say releasing it into the wild <laughs> mm, oh, definitely definitely because i think wasn't there also that um that voice or the it was an ai sort of bot that they put on on the internet and within a few moments it had turned racist and sexist just from studying um what it had been exposed to and then providing feedback and so you can see how something that we don't really understand the implications uh, could go rogue and kill us all because it could have that much, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, much. it could. It certainly could. Yeah. Um. But but I, I know that there's a lot of people who say, oh no, that'll never happen. But but I but I think that that what we'll see in the next you know twenty years will be um, examples of where. Um, especially with also the blending of drone technology with um, AI. So drones is almost like a form of flying, let's say flying robot, um, you know, being involved with um, with terrorism events or other events in the future. But, but you know, those same flying, flying drones or flying robots could rescue people. Like I'm a volunteer at a surf life-saving club um, or at, at Minjeraba or Point uh, as North Stradbroke Island, and um, you know, for us, we've got two beaches that we patrol there. Um, we've got a, a certain number of volunteers, and so drone technology with like an AI overlay to sort of um, see if if swimmers are in danger would be a really awesome sort of bolster to to community safety. And then the human resources um, at this stage could be targeted at the sort of heavier rescue type components. But they're they're trialing all sorts of really amazing um, concepts to do with that that are actually meaning that it's safer for humans because before for example like someone would have to get in on a long ladder or a cherry picker or um abseil up a, a large silo green silo to check whether or not there's any cracks or or issues and now you can um actually get a, a, a drone scanning um councils that i have a connection to they also are using forms of robotic uh, technology to check pipes that before some poor person would have to crawl down these dark and dingy pipes and you know which wouldn't be necessarily a fun or safe job but now you can just send a bot down and they can video it and then AI over the top to which has been trained to sort of see where the cracks are and then targeted intervention can happen so you know they're just two sort of really simple um, e examples of how this can be incredibly beneficial and those jobs that um, humans really may not want to do um, can actually be augmented or or replaced in some circumstances. That actually then mean if those humans would like to actually do things that are that are different, um, they can actually spend time on being supported to evolve to that different different role. Like the person who maintains the bot, or the person who actually learns how to how to sort of code, um, if if that's what they'd like to do. Yeah, well, actually, two two thoughts pop up um, when you mentioned that. You know, firstly, would be um, and one of those major benefits is global warming or climate change. You know, mm. these are things that um, humans we don't really. Uh, I mean, from my understanding, anyway, and I could be completely wrong, is that you know we don't really have the checks and balances in place to kind of um, stop or prevent this from um, progressing further. Whereas, if we had to develop um, artificial intelligence that can actually think really creatively. Um, it could come up with a solution that we never would have dreamt about um, and then actually executed it in a much shorter time than we could have ever imagined, you know. So there is, mm. um, that, that is a, almost a life-threatening issue that, that we do need to, to deal with. Um, yeah. And then I think yeah. the second point that spurred to mind when you were talking about, um, you know, freeing up jobs so people can do what they want, and I think this leads to another question that I'm quite curious about is, 
if you had to have now all of these jobs, as it had happened in the Industrial Revolution, but now amplified, that um, robots can now do for us, um, where where do you see that it's progressing? Would there be roles that humans can still do by themselves, or would it be more so the fact that you would have to create a um, universal basic income, which I know Elon Musk has mm. briefly mentioned as a possible solution, but it could be quite dangerous um, in the sense that you would have to, you know, then do something to the government in order to receive your money. Um, is that something that you think would be potentially happening, or, um, yeah? Yeah, I think I think definitely something like that may happen. Um, to me, it boils down to the concept of um, um, inequity that could could occur. So, for example, um, the groups that will be progressing the fastest in areas of artificial intelligence are countries or you know global corporations that have the the power and the collateral and the cash to actually um, progress quickly. But then there'll be a number of um, organisations where um, it won't happen overnight because um, unless the cost of these um, these forms of technology um, get to a point that is sort of um, a reasonable sort of price, like it, like that it offsets the cost benefit analysis of, of doing this sort of balances out for for the particular business. Uh, one of the <laughs> yeah, so that, so that means for me that I, I think that the concept of a universal basic income is, is going to have to be sort of theoretically um, considered. And I know it has been considered in a number of different countries before, and then it's been sort of put to the side. I think in a way the COVID pandemic um, has actually brought it back up um, as, as a concept, especially um, given the amount of people who um, are, are still doing it tough um, as a result of um, various restrictions and other processes that have been happening um, where e even in Australia, as you may be aware, like they they actually bolstered um, people's um, income uh income protection, they bolstered um, some of the government-related benefits that were accessible to even small businesses which weren't available before. They increased the, the job seeker payment, but then um, unfortunately then they decreased it again, which I which I don't think was a good good move at all when when for some people, you know, the cost of living is is not covered by um, that base level. So the, if there is a universal basic income, I think it needs to be um, appropriate for um, having a, a generally okay life. <laughs> as opposed to one which which implies that that you're you're the person that gets the home home brand tin of beans all the time yeah. and and yeah. can't afford the the um the the branded version just as a mm. you know silly, silly example i i do a lot of work with um organizations that are um, would be considered non-profit organizations so they work with um people who might have alcohol and drug addictions or people who are escaping domestic and family violence or people with a disability and i think in, in terms of ai and robotics you know how if, if people, um, some of the jobs that were, let's call them the, the, the sort of um, frontline processing type roles that maybe some people might just want to try for um, just to get them into the workplace, if they're going to be the prime targets first for bigger corporations, it, it could lead to greater inequity. But then it would also mean that there'd need to be the ability to, to um, provide people learning opportunities so that if they wanted to be involved in the space that they could without going and doing a, a degree at university. Yeah, so it's yep. it's a tricky tricky one, you know, like like I just think of, you know, people leaving grade 12 this year and some people want to go to university and others might try to get a job as a receptionist, for example. But in the future, you could just have um, um, an AI concierge who answers the phone, um, triages, a chatbot, or they're already everywhere. You know, they take the basic requests and then there's a triage to for more complex questions. Um, yeah, so it is making it tough if, if there is just a, a blanket um, a blanket um, shift and change. People yeah. need a bit of time to sort of um, be able to find other purposeful, meaningful work 
um, mm. that is purposeful for them. And, you know, a cleaner could could be very um, excited and joyful about their work. And, uh, and so it's not about the type of job. It's about the does this bring a purposeful feeling um, to the to the person does it actually resonate with them and does it actually enable them to have the life for themselves and their families that that at least is is um is an okay one yeah yeah actually um i finished reading this book uh called 21 lessons for the 21st century i don't know if you've heard about it or read yeah. about it or yeah maybe. okay yeah yeah, anyway, it was, it was really interesting. And, um, you know, the first few chapters was actually talking about artificial intelligence. And um, one of the the key points, which I thought was really brilliant, was saying, you know, um, how much, like what you were saying with the university degrees, is like people will be graduating or thinking of studying, but the, 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 the area that they're studying in might not actually be relevant and or applicable in the next few years. You know, I mean, language, for example, some people love studying language, but you know, and, and they want to become a translator. But you already have um, apps now that um, can translate in real time for you. Um, you know, so maybe each person would have an earpiece in and you would actually understand exactly what the person's been saying um, in real time. Um, so mm. he was kind of moving to um, the sense that, you know, the best thing you can really teach your children right now is to be flexible and to be versatile and say, well, how can I adapt um, in this forever changing environment? Um, instead of uh, sticking to old structures that have been stable, mm. the old yes. structures won't be stable anymore or yes. relevant. Yeah, I, I agree that ability to to basically have a learning capability, you know, the, and resilience, I think, is also important. Um, that that ability to be able to be be resilient because, you know, just look at the last two years alone, you know, that, that's been a massive shock to the world um, about what's what's been going on with the pandemic and and but but you see different businesses, some have been able to flip it really, really successfully and um, have been able to just say, yep, we can make this work. They're sort of versatile and, and flexible, those words that you were talking about. And then there's other businesses that are going, oh, you know, we can't, we can't do it. And and we can't, we can't sort of um, make that work for a variety of different reasons um, that may not be about um, lack of trying. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it does, does make it really challenging. So for me, I think at the moment, like if, if I was, um, uh, a parent with a kid in grade 12 who just left, I'd be saying just focus on what makes you feel pas passionate and pur purposeful, but focus on being able to be an awesome learner and someone yeah. who who is not afraid. Like Carol Dweck um, talks about the concept of a growth mindset. Um, mm. You know, growth mindset is connected to concepts around learning and it's about um, almost a little bit like mindful practice about going, I'm, I'm mindful, but I'm also not limiting myself. And and if I have limiting beliefs that she call, calls fixed mindset sort of traits, mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's try to see if we can remove them. And, and you know, you can, you can. I, I certainly have uh, my life of... Um, and through my original social science qualifications, like there's a range of different techniques that you can apply with, with the right person. Often, like might be a coach or a counsellor or a healer, um, to to be able to remove unwanted um, beliefs. So it's a bit like a yeah. if our brain is an AI, we can recode aspects of our brain, but it does take work and commitment and reinforcement, like what it would do for an AI. I'd say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I suppose the AI would just be doing it in a split second. <laughs> yeah, yeah they take well, you hope so, yeah. <laughs> but no, and, and definitely going into that minor space, um, mindfulness space. I mean, I've obviously um, fully delved into that whole area <laughs> with open arms um, and an open heart is that, you know, the more that you are present and aware, um, the easier it is to to be aware of habits that are harmful or helpful. And exactly yes. like you just said, model the um, behaviours around that um, and know what to, to fuel and what to um, to, to pull back on. Um, and yes. you can't really do that when you're caught up in your head, you, you're stuck in the past, you know, you're thinking of fears in the future. You, you kind of, you can't be aware of what you're doing right now. Um, and so then that's where that breathing, that stillness um, mm. is so, so important. Um, yeah. But yeah, leading, yeah, leading back to AI, would you, if you're looking at, um, you know, us talking about all of these jobs, um, you know, that could have um, be taken over, but obviously then freeing up space for us to do what we, we enjoy. Do you think that um, there would ever be a time 
where we, you know, looking at once again, um, Elon Musk, and I'm using him as an example because, mm. you know, I saw this yeah. really awesome um, picture uh, illustration and it showed all of the, you know, um, Stephen Hawking's and, um, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins, all these people that um, were interested in this field and, and, and what that kind of said about AI. And so you have Mark Zuckerberg on the one side saying, you know, full, full speed ahead, I'm ready to do this. And um, you have people like Stephen Hawking's were kind of like, I think we should um, take it nice and slow. You know, he, he was, I think his famous quote was, um, you know, I feel more comfortable with black holes than I do with <laughs> artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> and, and then you have Elon Musk who's in the middle. You know, obviously all of his businesses um, are heavily in, you know, AI with um, self-driving cars, which is 100% um, connecting real time on, on how to make decisions. Um, and mm. he's now a massive push for Neuralink. And, uh, you know, I think his whole statement was, if you can't beat AI, you've got to join AI. And if you don't join AI, um, you know, we could get left behind and, and who knows what, what would happen in that space. And so he's obviously heavily invested in this company, which inserts a chip into your, your brain, um, which would help with Alzheimer's, um, dementia, uh, sight, hearing so on and so forth but on the other end you know you are connecting to AI and so I'm just curious as to your thoughts on that whole thing and and do you think that there's another way to do that do you think that um that's the only way what what are your thoughts on that area Mm, yeah, it is. A, it is interesting, isn't it? Because I know that there'd be a number of people with um, with some um, particular physical or um, um, sort of uh, physiological, mental, sort of psychological related challenges that Neuralink, if it if it's actually going to do what it's intended to do, would be really powerful for people. So, you know, like um, it could mean that someone who might be paralysed, for example, can operate a phone or computer. Or, or might even be able to um, through through their neurological processes even um, drive a um, a, a uh, exoskeleton type process. You know, and be able to sort of essentially walk around even though you've got a, a permanent paralysis. So, so in some things you think, oh, you know, that's that's going to be really awesome, um, mm. a really awesome process. But I, I do know that, that of course, uh, all of this technology comes with really awesome positive elements, but it can also theoretically come with things that are not as um, not as likely. So, you know, Neuralink could be, could be hacked, for example, <laughs> or a Neuralink could maybe control uh, people um, uh, by um, doing sort of different, different sort of wave emissions that that start to change change people's um, view of the world and and so there's yeah. with all of these things there's balances that come in place but but I know for some people they'd think oh you know it'd be totally fine to be slightly you know slightly a bit phased if if it, if it can get me walking if it can get me interacting if it can get me as a paralyzed person you know to be able to actually pick a cup up and, and drink out of it or you know or make a phone call without asking my carer to come and do that and it could be really powerful. Um, I don't know enough about the technology, um, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that that it's certainly going to be something that will be coming, um, and uh, I think it will have to have to come with um, a, a number of caveats and very close observations as to what um, the broader health implications might be. Um, you know, there, there was when mobile phones ca first came out, people were sort of having issues about, you know, what does does this lead to, you know, cancer or, or what are, what are the problems with mobile phone utilisation, and everyone went through a headset stage. <laughs> of um you know or the hands-free sort of concept um yeah so i don't i'm not fully sure of where it could lead but i know that for some for some people they they probably wouldn't care they would just care about the immediate return and the immediate benefit that they'd actually get which they might have been not having for some time yeah i suppose from a not even philosophical like a psychological standpoint you know you only view the world through your, you've got your um, inputs, so your sensory receptors, your eyes, your ears, your nose, um, your tongue, you know, so on. And so you can pick up all of these senses, but once they come in, they all get turned into uh, electrical signals, um, which then your brain interprets, and then, you know, that's how you view mm. the world. If you have to um, just plug in the electrical signals, which you can do, um, you know, they already do it through transcranial magnetic stimulation, mm. um, TMA. 
uh, where you can already stimulate certain areas of your brain to activate um, cognitive uh, thinking or behavior. You know, yeah. people who are addicted to substance, you can just, you know, <laughs> apply some some signals there and eventually, you know, you no longer really crave that anymore. But the yeah. problem with that, like you you know, you'd be having thoughts maybe that are implanted in your brain that you had never really had, but you have no idea that that was not a real memory. You could honestly believe that you did X, Y, and Z, and therefore you thought X, Y, and Z. And so people would have no idea that the behaviors changed. Um, yes. But then again, you know, you can actually see that implication already playing out with social media and, um, and, and how technology already because we're being exposed to it um so peripherally um it, it's <laughs> everywhere like you, you'd go through your, your news feed and you don't realize it'll start with one point and then it'll show a related video that's slightly similar but a little bit different slightly similar and eventually so far on one side um, yes i don't even realize that um this would yeah. just do it in a faster faster way yeah yeah definitely definitely could do um yeah so i i think it's it's an area to look at um really carefully um i think it's it's one of those concepts that someone said to me oh we are we're you know well we are already cyborgs you know the concept from science fiction a cyborg meaning a sort of part human organic being with with machine yeah. combo and and someone said you know since most people are so connected to their <laughs> smartphones that we're already sort of like that already um even though we can hopefully put it down at night and we have a rest um yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so now you've also got um you know i think bill gates released a statement uh yesterday or um i read about it recently and it was just saying you know he predicts that in the next three years um you know something like 50 60 percent of people will be um all having their meetings on um on the metaverse you know which is entirely full virtual reality and so you think yeah. well gosh 60 percent of, of the workforce is doing that all on a virtual space um where you've got this headset on in your mind you are in you know you really are seeing this person face to face you are already in this environment um you could even see how that environment could be um much more heavily um altered uh controlled observed um you know it, it does lead to so many red flags but then like you said so many exciting elements of being able to connect to anybody in the world mm. or, you know, experience a life of being Superman. You can fly, you can, you know, you're not bound by, by the laws yeah. of gravity. Yeah. Yes. Simulations. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I sort of sometimes also think of the implications to people's health, um, you know, as, as you would, you know, given, given your, your background, like, you know, if you're, um, if you're sedentary, for long periods of time like if you know like a lot of people have been working working from home or working from a home office and I am that's where I am right now and so um you know you, you're sedentary and vi vi virtual reality might mean that you're um you could theoretically be more sedentary or maybe it will actually get you um within a safe safe physical space um uh, walking around more but but I, I honestly think that um, if we're thinking more more broadly about um, humanity and our planet like we need to we need to sort of get our priorities set and and for me um, sometimes I think um, AI can be something that is incredible for the good of good of humanity um, but then it can also be something that that has implications and some of those implications are things that aren't obvious um, until you start sort of looking at as I call like the consequences of the consequences of decisions that that we make. Mm. Yeah. So what sort of so what sort of um, steps or things would you pass to people listening um, to to either prepare themselves or you know should they be mindful of things like Neuralink should they be you know what what sort of how how would you best say to to show up in this new space that we are presented with? Yeah, I think one of the most important um, important parts of um, of of preparation for people is. Uh, some of those concepts we talked about before around our, let's tune up our adaptation, adaptive capacity. Let's tune up our our resilience and our coping strategies. Let's tune up our ability to learn and be flexible. Let's understand what our beliefs and mindsets are. So I, in, in the change base, I always say that change starts with the individual first. And so it is it is definitely for me something that's really important for 
um, people to grow their um, adaptation skills, but also what I'd like to call is their futures sort of anticipatory sort of practices. So it means that we can can yes you know remain grounded in the present but also have a degree of antis- anticipation for the future or possible futures with an s um i think it's also important for people to um despite all this wonder around us from a technology perspective is to maintain um people's personal sense making practices um and that that means that if we if we initially while while these sorts of technologies are being formed and grown and developed they are being grown and developed by people with certain mindsets um, and they're not necessarily in their development going to a broad base of people um, as you mentioned earlier the um, you know some gender related discrimination some um, racist tones within programming because a lot of people who who once were in these areas that were developing it were, were often um, uh, sort of reasonably at least middle class if not more um, often often um, in the early days more white in um, their cultural dimensions and sitting in Silicon Valley in the states which which means that that whole in-country culture type process might have had a had an effect on how they viewed the world um, so I think it's that for, for me it's about not also not being afraid of the future but just being being ready and having that that sort of really broad ability to um to to just make sure that you do your research mm-hmm. but also not not necessarily not participate like you know i would certainly be thinking very seriously as to whether or not i want to have a neurolink inserted into my body but but you know at the moment for me i'm a healthy person um my values are where i don't like putting a lot of things unless they're important um into into my body um uh so so for some people the thought of a chip um being plugged into your your body would be something that i'd think we all have a choice and we mm. need to go go willingly and understandably into the decision making process with information from a variety of sources, but also um, note the implications of what happens if I did get Neuralink versus if I didn't. What's the what's what will I lose? What will I gain? Um, and what then overall am I really um, satisfied with that alliance with my purpose? Mm. Why I'm here. I mean, this could be a, a whole podcast on its own, but it's honestly yeah, like the philosophical totally. element of like, you know, what when you insert this chip, will you cease to become you? You know, it's that whole if you had one um, one atom or, or one particle or one um, cell of yours and you, you move it across to a different Alexa, at one point, at what point will I stop to become me and that new person will become um, will become me? And so with this, it's like as soon as you're plugging something into your brain that now connects you to the internet directly, connects you to AI directly. So as soon as AI learns, you learn straight away. You know, you can get that that information, you know, almost simultaneously. Uh, I think you do, in a sense, stop becoming you. But, um, you know, that, that that's, a, that's a whole thing. Yeah, another, another conversation. We need another <laughs> few, hours. A few hours to talk about that. But yeah. I, I, I think it's just that, that concept of openness, adaptability, um, and learning those three key words, and 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 I, I just honestly think that um, if if we can actually start to shape um, really good decision making processes, especially in organisations who are investing AI, I just honestly think keep keep human impacts as, as part of your decision making process. Don't just make it about profit or economy. Make it also about, well, if I get rid of all the receptionists and have um, robot concierge um, mm-hmm. instead of Jane, the friendly reception lady, um, what will that mean for my culture, yeah. my mm-hmm. customer experience? my um, What will that mean for the receptionist Jane's um, life and her family mm-hmm. and the and if, yeah, so just think more broadly than just the walls of the organisation. The scary thing about that is that, you know, at the moment, um, most of most of the decisions, like you mentioned earlier, um, you know, most of the investments in AI have come from um, the uh, army or the um, military kind of space. And so they've always got one agenda, which is to gain power um, and to protect or maintain their current power. Um, and so you've also got large companies like Facebook, Amazon, um, whose main 
objective is to maximize profit. And so um, it's kind of it kind of sucks because in that sense, I can see that there's a blame game where us as customers are saying, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook, you should really um, start to change your way of, of ethic, you know, your ethical standards and how you're approaching your business. And then you have um, Mark Zuckerberg saying, well, it's not me, it's my shareholders. And so you go to the shareholders and say, shareholders, why, you know, why are you doing this? And they're going, well, it's not us. We're just collecting dividends. It's actually the company. And the company's saying, well, it's not us. We're just trying to supply a product to meet the consumer's needs. It's the consumers. They yeah. want pointing fingers at but yet there's no change really being made and a lot of these companies are run without, you know, with very little um, ethical standards and um, key, uh, key, key principles yeah. to kind of go off and yeah. that are heavily invested. In. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that um, definitely, um, yeah, definitely I think um, that the consequences of the decisions that they make need to really really just also have a lens around that's that's true not just lip service to um the our planetary and human futures like you know as you mentioned the climate climate crisis like ai has been already utilized by climate scientists that show you know oh gosh this is looking pretty bad and they've got like historical ability i um uh, caught up with someone recently who had these amazing um these amazing maps that that basically because they'd taken the same sort of aerial photos of of this set of this beautiful part of the world um, over um, something like you know thirty years or something, so the same you know um, image, and then they've put an AI overlay over the top of that, and and so it can see the 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 shift to the coastline and the change, um, and and they can see also um, nowadays uh, with with the satellite communication technology that might also look at heat and and other other sort of patterns um, start to honestly see a picture of how different areas are starting to shift and change and and have the evidence and the and almost the visual story that that demonstrates it which in the past we didn't have because you know it was just a a still photo yeah. That couldn't be sort of overlaid. It had to be meticulously, you know, someone with a, a ruler and looking at looking at different levels of change as opposed to now uh, with the right degree of coding. Um, yeah, I can zip through those processes and go, you know, this is what 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 it could look like. And based on this trend, this is what it could go to. And and that is where the sort of scary stories start to come, but also where the incredible opportunity comes, where we can start to utilise AI to make better informed decisions about all sorts of stuff. Yeah, like you can even see for, because um, I know one of the major issues that we're facing, uh, along with many other major issues, is overfishing, you know, and you have... Yeah. Um, people just absolutely overfishing and just killing killing the oceans. But you could see, you know, maybe if there was um, all all ships were um, AI dominant, you know, maybe they could go in and there'd be these nets that would maybe only catch an X amount of the, the school of fish so there would be enough for it to repopulate. You know, it would never catch dolphins accidentally. It would be a way to, uh, you, you know, that, that could be possible. I mean, there's – and, like, I, I think there's a recent company that's come out um, – I think it's like deep blue or something like that, and um, yeah. it's created. It's not really AI. It's that goes into the ocean and only collects rubbish, and it's um, yes. it's been phenomenal in cleaning up, cleaning up the ocean. And I think that um, leads me to such a beautiful saying, um, which is the easiest way to predict the future is to create it, and it really only takes. You know, I had this conversation the other day. This one person um one of my friends messaged me saying you know why do you talk about such intense topics that we can't do anything about you know it feels like you are diving too deep or something like that and and i said you know it really just takes one person just one person to create a company that could be highly impactful in our society and just like this one guy who decided to you know create this um company to clean up the ocean it really was yeah. one man who was inspired and so the yeah. more one on one, we become inspired, we could honestly uh, create a future that is not so um, dystopian and, and scary, but something that's uh, really, w that we'd be looking forward to and, and would love to live in. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, and I think that's, that's a really good place to sort of 
um, to to focus on is that the future could could be something really really beautiful, but it does still require us to have um, some degree of joint goal. Um, mm. around our planet or about humanity and, and then um, for me it's about trying to encourage um, the investment in AI to, to shift from what, what could be seen almost as a bit more individualistic um, you know economic profitability for one organisation or you know our, our competition and a buying power etc to more of a collective sort of ethical and humanitarian um, process such as clean water, food production, um, health enhancing solutions, um, you know, m being able to build affordable housing using um, greater technology and construction methods, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but, um, yeah, we have the opportunity, but, but we do need the voices to sort of support it. And that's one of the things that I'm committed to doing Love as a result of Love this work. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And so, um, just to wrap up, it might not be the best wrapping up question, but I was just curious if you think that we have reached singularity or if, how long would it take until we do reach singularity? Because some people say three years, some people say 10 years. Um, what are your views? <laughs> uh, yes, it's a good one. Good question because um, originally, like I think it was, What's his name? Kurzweil um, or Kurzweil um, thought that it was probably going to be um, in the in the two thousand and thirties um, when it would happen, uh, and then people started thinking, "Oh, maybe not." Um, but but I I think that um, depending on what how people define sentience. Um, I think it will probably be um, unless the earth explodes, which is, you know, the other <laughs> stream with our climate change issues or, or the, the unrest that could happen in the planet, um, which yeah, are bigger, bigger issues, could be sometime in the next, uh, by 2050. By then, I'll say, I'll have a range. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's but that to me, I think this like we've got to actually get through, <laughs> live still as a yeah. as a human race, and I think the planet is giving us some really firm views that we've got to pick our socks up. Mm. But you know, I think on the positive side, I really am quite impressed by um, the amount of people who are actually talking about you know planet Earth as a living, breathing thing because it obviously is. I mean, all yeah. life is by this planet and it's also interconnected and um you know it's it's just it, i really do i really do have hope for humanity and i really do have hope for um for this hurdle because that's the one thing with like um was it Carl sagan that was saying you know th there has to be life on other planets also it's an awful waste of space but we don't really understand the hurdles that need to um that that intelligent life needs to overcome in order to survive and i feel like the hurdles we're really embracing at the moment which is like are we going to destroy our planet? Are we going to turn it into a place like Mars? Um, is there going to be a World War Three? And if there is, um, will we survive from it? You know, it's um, there's a lot of these mm. things that are coming within this lifetime. You know, another beautiful saying is, um, decades happen without much change, and right now we're experiencing decades of change in a very short period of time. And it, it mm. honestly comes down to how we choose to react as a collective. Um, yes. You know, and, and leave that top. 0.01% are not, um, you know, sociopathic, <laughs> power yeah. hungry. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think, you know, I, I am, am hopeful for the future. I think that um, technology can be a really important part of our, of our future, um, you know, Nirvana sort of new, new Eden in the future. Um, but, it, but it does require us working together um, well. And I, I don't know whether we are quite there yet, but if we're on the way to that, um, or if maybe it's through individual action, maybe it's through collective action of individual members of the community working together. Um, yeah, but but I'm really hopeful, and I I know I would love it if we um, if we um, could have this conversation in 30 years time. Maybe we should book it in, Alexa, <laughs> and and um, and and yeah, hopefully hopefully have a really um, powerful conversation of wow, isn't this awesome? 
oh, oh my gosh. I mean, you know, that's that's the thing is I can't, we cannot comprehend what we will be experiencing in 30 years time because the way that technology is advancing so rapidly is when AI starts to create machinery that we never would have comprehended to be possible. You know, it's like we could have technology that is not even part of our awareness and that in a way is just so, so exciting um, yeah. to just see what we like. Yeah, the art, the music, the, you know, like the other um, forms of creativity that I know some, you know, amazing artists are, are utilising AI. Uh, I met a great lady uh, um, in Melbourne a few years ago who um, is, is applying AI in, in fashion, modern forms of fashion design and manufacturing. Um, I just think that there's so many applications of it um, and, and whether sentience is, is important or not, I don't know. Yeah. fully yeah. but i know it is an aspiration for some some people out there um but, but whether we need it don't know mm. yeah mm. <laughs> excellent no, well, this has been absolutely phenomenal and uh, once again i really appreciate your time and um i really hope that this may inspire somebody who's listening to um you know take action in some beautiful ethical way and um you know yeah it's just been absolute absolute pleasure so thank you so much thank you so much and um and and Please have a, have a wonderful rest of your your week. We'll do. We'll do. Okay. Thank you. Take care.